Welcome to the Crypto Podcast. You can find all our episodes on the CryptoPodcast.org. We're also on BitChute and YouTube. You'll find the links in the podcast description. I'm also a podcasting coach because I've got four other podcasts with four getting to the top half percent. And this crypto currently at one and a half or two percent. And you'll find everything on bio.link forward slash podcaster. Today, my guest, German, but currently living in Vienna, Austria, Clemens Berend, did I do it justice? That's perfect, Clemens Berend. Okay, so you might just let the listeners know who's Clemens. Oh, my name is Clemens Berend. Um, I worked for the last five years in the crypto industry and at a, a position that every one of you affects. So I worked in customer service. So what I did, I scaled up the whole customer service operation for Bitpanda, Austria's first unicorn. Bitpanda is like a nail broker for like all assets that you can imagine. So from stocks, cryptocurrency, metals, and everything else. So they started like as a cryptocurrency broker only. And during last the last five years, of course, I had like many, many chances to talk and onboard new users into the crypto space. So I know like how it is and like what people actually motivates and drives them about crypto or also like what challenges the space and the whole industry is facing because I think like the crypto industry has not the best reputation overall and especially when it comes to customer service a lot of people are complaining that like the standards of customer service are not that high compared to other industry in the crypto industry because as we all know bitcoin or crypto is everything what people don't understand about money or the internet combined in one thing. So that's what we want to talk about today. So let's talk about customer service in the crypto industry. How can we make it better? And maybe also how we can understand why certain things are maybe not going so well. Since half a year, I started like a consultancy. It's called Web3CX. So as the name is saying, um, it's everything about like customer experience in Web3. And um, a friend of mine, Dominic Kuhn, who I'm doing this together, we are right now helping several crypto companies. So from classic cryptocurrency brokers, from crypto tax tools, from crypto data analytics tool, uh, crypto trading bots, or like blockchain infrastructure providers, or all sorts of um, crypto companies. And we help them to make once the customer experience um, better, but also like the customer service. Okay, excellent. So I'd like to jump back a step before we go into that in detail. What's your crypto journey? My crypto journey is super excited, to be honest. So I think, when was it? Um, Like 10 years ago, I think like in 2000, from 2010 to 2012, I had like an online Sedeki shop. So this was actually my first own company somehow so what i did actually i bought like computer games uh, at one place and resold them at another place like online actually somehow like trading and back then the most part of the business was like customer service and like for people who go on my linkedin they can still find the shop so how i bought with the users and delivered like the computer games to them and the main payment method was like pay self card so PaySafe card were like these prepaid cards for the phone. So you go into a shop, charge some money on it, then you have like a, digi- a few digit code and then you can send it to somebody and they receive the money. Um, but as things are going, so not only in crypto, but also like with that kind of payments, at some point there was a regulation rolled out. So it was not that easy to handle the payments anymore. And then I looked for an alternative. And so I asked around and I had like from one of my friends, the brother, um he was like um into crypto and he told me then about bitcoin so it was like in 2013 it was a little bit after Morgox. that was really well for me that i didn't come that early to the party because when everybody was trading through Morgox, a lot of people of course uh, lost the money and we had the luck in germany there was like a marketplace around um called bitcoin.de it's still around but this was like in 2013 so i made my first trade and it was a bank wire of like 10 euros um through this marketplace of for like 0.1 bitcoin or something really funny that you could like even buy with such small amounts because i was like a student back then 
And the lucky thing with the hype in 2013, I was actually able to manage like to sell the top because like the top was around like um, one thousand dollar or euro or whatever. Um, but then like the hype faded, and this was like doing my studies. So I studied pure economics, and I had also the choice like do I do something with computer science or pure economics? But I decided to do pure economics. And then doing my studies, I suffered like a lot because nobody want to really talk about crypto because it was such a new topic. And it really surprised me when I was like around a, a lot of people who was into um, economics. So in, I think then like in 2016, 2017, like things picked up again. And I then did my bachelor thesis in both like together with the with Telefonica, like a telecommunication provider, they had a cooperation with the Fido Bank. And the Fido Bank is maybe known for some people because it's like the first bank actually in the world, they are from Munich, who had a cooperation with a um, crypto exchange with Kraken. So I advised them like to build some prototype into this bank account where people could actually trade on our, uh, in the, on our front end. But they also did. So like even today, when you're logging into this bank account, you can trade crypto, but it's really, really nice. Um, so then when this thing was finished, the same friend who told me about uh, Bitcoin back then sent me then a job posting about the customer service position for Bitpanda. And then I applied and then like when I got the confirmation that I can start, I took two big luggage and then I moved to Vienna. And then uh, the whole journey at Bitpanda uh, started. I think when we started back then, we were like 10 or 20 people, something around that. And then, of course, like through these two cycles and um, with what I went with the company and um, we grow like as the most crypto companies like to an extreme size. Excellent. And I I read as well that uh, you were advising a winery to start using uh, Bitcoin. You might tell me about ah, that. That's that kind of... was very in that was in interesting. Glad that you asked about it. So to be honest, like these two months, what I did with this consulting project were like one of the two toughest months in my life and because like this this project was really demanding and they told me then like once that they are like shipping things to china and something with the payment is always like it was crazy i think they said that they need like three weeks or something to handle the payments and i like even back then like the chinese were like super involved into crypto so i just told him about it and said like yeah okay maybe you try just that way like maybe it's quicker when you just do like a transaction and back then like even bitcoin transactions were like uh, super fast and i think they even tested it like for one or two clients but i also think in the meantime a lot of things also with banks um improved because they really felt like the pressure from bitcoin and like other cryptocurrencies, that's also the reason why we now have like all these SEPA instant payments um, and so on. So I think there like crypto definitely had like a good positive impact in regard of uh, competition to the traditional financial system. Yeah, excellent. And I know you were uh, d doing something as well or discussing about uh, like using the mining as like a heat exchanger, you know, so that you could kind of be heating houses or businesses. Was that something that you were proposing or what was that about? It was only in theory. Um, now in practice, there is actually a product in Austria, which they now ship. And this is due to the due to, to latest energy crisis. But even back then, so when I was like in Munich, I went to like some sort of Bitcoin meetup. And there was like a guy like, even telling a story that like somewhere in Romania they placed like some miners below like a school to use the heating. So like the the pollution and like the heat, the heat goes up and then like the room above is warm and that's really funny because my grandparents they grew up on a farm and that's like the same thing what they did back then with the cows. So when you look into uh, to a farm usually the living room is above the place where the cows are because of the methane or what goes up from the cows, like it also heats the living room. And since I was then like working in my village for like some, um, I think some reseller of like air conduction systems or something. So I told him about it, but we only discussed it uh, in theory. I think it never went into production, maybe because also like the energy prices back then were like uh, quite low. I think since last year, the momentum was uh, quite better and like this idea um, was around for a very long time and I think now you can in Aust at least in Austria all of the first 
um, prototypes of these Bitcoin heaters, but not like in any relation um, to me. But this was just like an idea that was regular discussed um, in these Bitcoin meetups. Okay. And did you ever do any kind of mining yourself? And the other thing is, I know that the noise from these machines is kind of, you'd have to have it in a basement or somewhere where you couldn't hear it. I don't know, has people overcome that uh, problem with noise? Yeah, it's it's super loud. That's definitely so, like in the living room is usually the wrong place. Um, the lucky thing is, I think when you are studying, a lot of universities have like this, uh, this living domes or domes where like student lives and there usually you have like all in price of energy and of course then like a lot of people like students like even back at, at, at my time i had like one friend and me like they do all then everybody is doing like at least a staking node so like what was very popular around then is like with peer coin this was like the first proof of stake coin to have like some raspberry pi running all the time and doing some staking i think we did like some gpu um, staking as, as well but not for um, too long because you need to do that like on a bigger scale then it's really getting profitable and when you only have like one room it's really uh, too loud and not handleable yeah and just like we've we've all heard about kind of ftx which has kind of not helped the crypto world blockchain technology because of the corruption that went on and if you kind of look at all the connections you know, which who's connected to Gary Gensler and a MIT and everything. Yeah, yeah, it's like yeah. it's deep. And what I actually found is uh, with Binance that I was looking at their financial report and I found that it was actually signed by the company, the accountants that check it. They were signed by Mazars as in the company and not by an individual. So in theory, that's not really protected either, even though that's probably one of the bigger exchanges out there. That's true about FTX. Um, maybe as a side story, like where well, like customer service experience really helped me to spot really early that something is fishy with FTX. So with FTX, it was quite easy for me. So what I'm doing like as a customer service manager, when I go on the website of an exchange, I first look at the FAQ page, like or at the help desk help center or however it's called. And like with FTX, they are, I'm also are running on Sendesk. And they had like even a two digit billion valuation were like super huge, but like the help desk and FAQ page looked like out of the box, like super shady, super bad. And like to customize like these help desk and FAQ page costs like $1,000, $2,000, not really much. And it's like something that you can really easily outsource. So this was like what ringed really my alarm at FTX that I said like, okay, when they don't care about that part of the business and it looks that bad compared to the rest of the website and something must be wrong with that service. And with Binance, I think it's a, there you can really see like from time they are like um, improving because like customer service element was also not that strong, but I did invest a lot um, in it. And I think like with like this audit and like this proof of reserve topics and everything what's going around, I think centralized exchanges can never do anything that like customers can fully trust in there. I mean, like then also like to the question if people should leave their assets like on Binance or not, whatever. I mean, I mean the CEO of Binance is also making their good point that like a lot of customers are losing um, their private keys and so on. But what can you then do like as a customer? I would maybe check like which exchanges are really regulated because like also what was the thing with Binance what really mind blowed me away that they didn't have like KYC roles for so long or they don't have any licenses. I mean, now they are in the process of getting these licenses for like each country where they operate in. But uh, usually like these places are nice to trade. You can do your few trades, but then of course, like get your funds out. If you look, for an exchange where you can leave your funds on and at least look that they are like regulated and have like a license um, within your country. But from past experience, I mean, regulators can also do mistakes. So I think like the whole thing is like quite in, in transparent, even if they do like these proof of reserves or audit reports and yeah. Okay. 
And with uh, Bitpanda, I mean, obviously getting in at an early stage was fantastic experience. And obviously you grew as a, you know, it became a unicorn. So like, what did you learn regarding customer service? You know, what, because building it from, I don't know how many employees, did you say 20 at the start when you came in? Yeah, when I started 20, I mean, like even my team, like when I started, we were like three or four people in customer service, like at the top, we were like up to 130. Now, of course, like way less since like then the the bear market um, started. So what were like the things that I, that I learned? So I think... One important thing what I learned, like sometimes when something bad to customers happen, they don't expect you to fix the things. They just want to have somebody to listen. So very often it happens that like customers are getting scammed or sending like some their funds to, I don't know, like to these scams, like send one Bitcoin, get two back. And then of course they never get something back. And I think like they are usually well aware of like when this happened, they are getting scammed. And like very often like as exchange, you just tell them like where we shortly like okay you cannot reverse transactions uh, you got scammed it's your issue of course like you should usually not handle these things because what's also like a big um, problem is like these customers they cannot reverse the bitcoin transaction but they can indeed reverse the transactions to your exchange so when they deposit before like fiat so they can then reverse like for instance their um, debit card deposit and then you as an exchange end up with the losses so you have like an interest like in educating your customers about scams and um, also like being transparent and so on. So for instance, there are also like warnings from certain regulators for services and then customers send funds to these services and they're not even aware that there's like a warning of, from the regulator because they don't know it. And then you lock their accounts, they have the funds locked at the centralized exchange because they sent to some shady service and then they don't know really what's going on. And then the whole thing is like really intransparent because very often you can also not tell the customer why you lock an account. So finding there like the right balance. And then like the next thing what I learned and maybe also like, so let's talk about like the biggest mistake what I made maybe like in my customer service uh, career so far. So we focused a lot on like self-service deflecting contacts and so on. So we always are like, okay, a ticket at something like what costs us money, we want to reduce that stuff. But actually like talking to your customers, like creates a connection with them. So this is like part of like the customer experience. And what you should then definitely do, and maybe also have like as your North Star metric for a customer support team, is like how easy it is to get in contact with the exchange. So that's like what a lot of like um, exchanges are doing wrong with the customer service. It's like super hard um, to reach them. And actually like reaching out to a customer support team, it should be minimum so easy, like writing a WhatsApp to a friend. And I think this is like the standard where everyone should aim for. Of course, this is like super difficult when you are going into like a crazy bull run and then receive like really like a few hundred thousand messages a day i also know like from other big crypto exchanges in the last time that they had like up to like half a million tickets in the backlog so imagine it like half a million oh. emails in your inbox with customers with money stuck and waiting for you so of course you need to leverage all the tools what you can do like as a customer service team so for instance like finding the bales in these tickets, finding the urgent topics, um, assigning the tickets automatically to the agents who know the things, then maybe like something with AI, which give, which like also analyze like what's urgent, what's not urgent, or like is money anywhere stuck in these tools, what you should then leverage. But overall, um, what customer service teams to team should do, be easy to reach. And of course, like leveraging all of these tools, which I mentioned. And like not in the crypto world, but I knew know people that were working for like a customer service kind of call center situations. And with the tickets, it was more about you got more credit for churning them through as opposed to resolving the ticket. And how can you make sure that people aren't kind of passing the book or not really closing it out? You know, because sometimes a customer you could be on maybe 15 minutes, maybe longer in, in, in your industry, but to make sure that the people that are working for you aren't trying to look better than they are, if you know what I mean. 
I totally know what you mean. Like, so workforce management is like a huge topic. And to be honest, I did it by myself. So we had like certain cues where we guessed that the tickets for these topics are not something that are general questions and not something like where money is stuck in the account. So that's like what was the question that we always asked us. Is there like any incoming or outgoing transaction which is stuck with us? And if that was not the case, then like in the craziest bull run, we said like, okay, there's a general question. We don't reply to it or we even just send like a mark for out of it. Of course, this should not happen, but it's like the, the simple um, reality. So like how can customer service teams overcome this? So you should implement like a quality assurance team. So you can even do this like internal or you can do it external. So if you're like working at an exchange and you cannot like do this internal, feel free to um, reach out to me so I can help you with finding a structure to do that external. But you should have like a delegated team that goes through all of the conversations that ha happens on a daily basis and then apply an internal quality score where you rate how these tickets are processed to your standards. Maybe you say like, okay, it's okay if you just, close certain tickets. If this is like how you set your own standards, that's totally fine. Because like what I also realized is when you focus like on this external metrics, like CSET, so where like people can rate like how good the support was, what they received. The really funny thing is like, what's the number one driver for customer satisfaction from cryptocurrency exchange? What would be your guess? It's just that their item resolved that's what they, their query is okay so something like like how quick they reply how good the reply is like something like that right that's like also what i saw like for i think for three or four years what we actually found out the number one reason for customer satisfaction for a cryptocurrency exchange for the customers is how well the portfolio is performing <laughs> like when people are up like a few hundred percent and you need like a whole week to reply some people are still super chilled oh yeah there's like this ten thousand euro transaction for me stuck there like because of some wrong reference or some manual check but on the other side the guy his all his portfolio went up like i don't know like 5x or something since one week then he's really like ah uh, yeah please fix it and like super calm but when prices are crashing like as in the last half year then it, like with the Luna crash and the FTX crash, no matter how quick or good you do this stuff. I mean, of course, like people will to a certain degree be satisfied, but innerly they are super angry because the portfolio is down. And then even when you only need like, I don't know, 10 minutes to reply or like an hour or like in the worst case, like more than 24 hours, what's like somehow the common sense. In the crypto industry, we apply within 24 hours. That's like the, the the number on what everybody agrees on. Like when you miss the target within a bear market where prices are crashing and all people are losing money, that people are really upset. That's very interesting. And with kind of chats then, like uh, AI, is it something that you find that builds and improves as it go along? Or did you find that it could actually hurt the brand by using that? Because I know if, I mean, I haven't done it on crypto, but say on banking, Revolut, but it just, it wrecks my head dealing with bots because you can never get what you want. But maybe it's different in the crypto industry. So I, so AI, so like chatbot is just one use case of AI. And I would also say on social media, chatbots are fine. I don't know why, but people expect it when they visit your Facebook page and write you a message on the Facebook page. You have their chatbot or like on Twitter DMs or Instagram DMs or what else do we have? Um, maybe even when you have a small one in Telegram or what else you are using on social media, for some reason, people barely complain. But like in especially Germany and Austria, the acceptance of chatbots is so bad. So when you put them in, into your product, people really go crazy. So therefore, we always left left it and didn't do it. I mean, now the thing like with bots as like ChatGBT, what they are doing different, they get the whole conversation. And that's like what the chatbots, which are currently implemented in the most banking applications, 
uh, crypto exchanges cannot do because they only understand like the last message. And when you go for a chatbot, make sure that it understands like the whole context of the of the conversations, also like the previous messages. And maybe go for something like that you have the chatbot only on mobile devices because like I think that's like way easier than clicking through some form. But like on web, having a chatbot maybe not that suitable but of course it depends like how you set the things up i think there's no strong yes or no to the answer in regards of chatbots um but when we speak about like ai that's something what you should definitely do and that's also like how we found out about this factor that like the bitcoin price is driving good sentiment and customer satisfaction it's actually something what we discovered with the help of ai so what you should do minimum with AI is like how you analyze customer feedback. Because the issue is when you are like in a customer service team and you're working together with a product manager, the product managers, usually they want to pull out the data on their own. Like this with everything, people want to firsthand research the things on what they make decisions. Very often they don't want to hear it from someone else because they know the customer service managers may be biased and only tells the things of the tickets which bothers them the most. And then you don't really get like the feedback that you hope for. So what you should do with AI, that you do like a sentiment analytics for which topics are discussed in your tickets and all social media channels in one place. It's like easily doable and easy to set up. So you then get like the topics, the sentiment, the volume, and then you see over time, like how these things are changing. And I think there AI outperforms any static reporting, what you could do based on, I don't know, topics in your contact form or whatever. Excellent. And what about uh, kind of customer acquisition then? Did you kind of get involved in that or what way were they building the, the customer base? So a customer acquisition. I think the number one tool, maybe from my perspective, I don't know that that well because I'm not involved. I'm more involved in the retaining part. But what we see a lot around exchanges are like these teller friend programs where you invite other users. So get, you get like a bonus, like you get 10 euro when you invite your friend. So these programs are like super popular. So like from anyone listen who's trying to grow his service. So there I have like an advice what you could do, make these programs always like a time limited promotion. So you start and you say like, okay, you get like 20 euros when you invite your friends now within the next three days. Because what happens with these programs spike when they start a lot of users coming in and then they flatter so actually what you want to do with this tell a friend programs every few weeks or whatever you launch different campaigns but they are really hard to navigate you also need to take care that users are not only signing up for the bonus and moving out the money and you also have to check based on the on the countries because like in each country you can calculate how much the people trade on average so you should give like different bonuses based on the locations because everybody knows that the customer lifetime value depending on the location might be um different yeah okay and also what's like another good driver is you just need to list certain coins so for instance last year there was a hype with dogecoin and i think um, Bitpanda was like the only one which had it listed against like zero or very easy to buy. At least there were not like many exchanges. And I can remember that night when like Elon Musk started tweeting about Dogecoin. And this was like the moments where like, of course, the most users came in for crypto.com. Um, it's the same with Shiba. So the main part of the success of crypto.com is because of Shiba, because it was like one of the first places where people from the US could buy with debit cards uh, directly Shiba. Okay. And with kind of like the social media then, because there's a million things out there, but I see it seems to be like Discord is one of the things that people kind of grow and Twitter seems to be, especially for NFTs and stuff like that. But what you're kind of go to what do you think is kind of better for somebody trying to build something with the social media? That's like an amazing question, also a hard one to answer. I think there's nothing better than like having an email address and phone number on your website. That's like the first thing with all of these social media. If you can manage to do that somehow, do it because like having the clear email and a phone number on your website gives you like a lot of trust. So this should be like in the perfect world, you would do that. But let's maybe have a look at all the different social media channels. 
So which social media channel is really, really bad, to be honest, for customers is Telegram, because Telegram is like full of scams. So what you need to do there, like setting up like a lot of scam warnings and like one of the worst things what I can tell from Telegram is, so my name, my first name is Clemens, I have an L in it. And what you can do on Telegram, instead of the L, you use a big I, looks the same, nobody can spot it. And then you can just go around with all of the people who have like an L in their name, make a big I, and then no chance for customers to see that this is like um, a scam account or somebody pretending. Then like the thing with Discord, I mean, they have like some better security measurements so you can turn off DMs on a certain server. So you should definitely do that. But like for Discord, I think it's more for the younger generation or for people who are into gaming. So it also depends, I think, a little bit on the type of customers what you have. I think the social media stuff is usually just a fallback when you don't have like customer support proper integrated within your app because this sh should be like in a perfect world how it goes. Having like customer support function or even like some sort of community forum directly implemented within your app because you don't want to have customers going outside of your app because what we know for instance from the gaming industry there's like a saying cannot play cannot pay. So we want to keep people within the app, within our ecosystem, to so try to get like these community functions within your cryptocurrency trading app. And I think this is something what we will see in the future, that people will start building again their own community forums directly in the app to better fight against scam and also to keep customers within the own app instead of having them on social media. Because also the bad thing with social media, of course, is people usually use it to complain about like customer service. Or maybe when they don't even find customer service within the app, they also go on social media. Yeah, excellent. And and I was admiring your picture uh, before we started and it kind of reminded me of like say, an NFT. Have you touched on NFTs? Are you involved in any of the NFTs? Yes, of course. Of course. Uh, I'm a big fan of the SEPI seals. Um, there I have like a, a few one and touch them, but uh, just keep ho uh, holding them. Um, in general world, now there are like these ordinals on Bitcoin. I definitely look into this, but I think like, maybe we are already too late to the party, but it's like what's really inciting that they actually brought now NFTs to um, Bitcoin. I think like for NFTs, there are like a few smart use cases besides like these profile pictures. So I think like for ticketing for concert tickets and um, where you can actually allow to resell them because of the loyalty fees the company who issued the tickets always get something back and i think like for certain events it's not allowed to resell the tickets when you maybe are sick and you cannot go off or whatever so i think this will be like the first real world use cases which we will see with nfts like on a global scale and i think therefore the use case um is uh, quite good um, on the other side, also with NFTs, I think it's great since it's onboarded like a lot of new users, especially people who thought they are too late to the party in crypto, then they hear of NFT and then they said, okay, I don't want to miss out on that now. So I think NFTs did more good for the industry than harm. And with, there's a lot of platforms, a lot of people trying to create different platforms to protect the users and have lots of different uh, for even the royalties that you can split it different ways is there any that you've found that you are kind of impressed with the the platforms that are using the nfts mm, i'm not so deep into the topic i mean i followed up on all the exchanges and marketplaces i mean looks right it's like a quite great job with the airdrop so we talked about user growth a little bit um, ago, so they knew their target audience. So they said, like everybody who traded NFTs during a given period, we drop like this token to them, where they also have an incentive that they grow with us because they receive this looks raw token. And when like the exchange or the market, the NFT marketplace or however we call it, do better, then also the value of these tokens um and increase so i think this was like a very good example but like to all of these lending platforms and like other platforms which are around with nfts i didn't look so much in detail into it to be honest okay and just finally like your own company like uh, ideal clients and your kind of onboarding process then what's your kind of typical structure the way that you do it so 
how we onboard clients at Web3 CX is quite easy. So usually they reach out to us. So for instance, they hear about a podcast um, like this, hear how we speak about certain topics. So the first question that we always ask them, what can we do for you? So it's like every client who comes to us, they don't get something out of the box. So for instance, for some reason, we have like a lot of like crypto text tools. So what we would never do is like, just because like one same company comes and says like improve our onboarding process or something like that, that we just copy it from another project. So we always look together with them, like what we can do for them. And then we set up like the project score. So what they want to achieve. So usually we look at like some sort of like North Star metric for the project. And very often it's like the customer effort score, which I already explained. So a lot of services then notice that like something is not going smooth and like products needs to be easy because like when a product is easy, I think Apple is there the best example. Then you can like outperform like everything. So let's assume we would then agree with the client on, okay, we want to make like every step, like the verification, deposit, trading, we want to make it easy for the clients. So we would then, for instance, implement with them like some sort of survey asking the customer after each step. But what we would also look at would also look at the main question, like how easy it is for the customers to reach out to customer service. So a lot of, of our clients were not aware that they have like many people who start using their service and then quit silently. And that's the worst thing what can happen to you as a service, because if you don't get a chance, at least a chance that like when a client leaves that he tells you what's going on that you have a chance to fix it because you also don't, never know like how big this part of the silent complainers is but this is then like the next part usually of the pro projects that we try to reduce the silent complaints and people are very often afraid that they then have like a huge backlog and like a lot of tickets where they cannot answer but that's not the issue because it's better to have like the feedback from somebody who leaves and then reply later and still have a chance to hold them with a discount or whatever, instead of him just leaving or her um, just leaving silently and never letting you know. So these are like somehow the things on what we work together with our clients. So this is just like an example project. Of course, we do like many other things around customer experience, but this would be like somehow the most standard one on focusing, making the product easy to use, especially when reaching out to customer support because we want to reduce like this amount of like silent complainers who leave your service and never tell you why. And you can easily then also calculate like a damage for your service. So most of our clients, they know or can estimate like the customer lifetime value of one client. And then you then know like, okay, you have like every month, I don't know, like 10% of your clients leaving. And of these 10%, like half of the clients write your message and the other half not. So what's like a no brainer? So to the people who leave you without going in a conversation with you, you just try to improve that number that you can do everything on retaining the customer. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Well, Clemens thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. You might let people know where's the best place to find you. So the best place uh, to find us is on web3cx.io. That's the domain where they can go directly. Otherwise, uh, they can go on LinkedIn and search for my name, uh, Clemens Behrendt, or they can also search for Web3CX on LinkedIn and just reach out then like via LinkedIn or go directly on the website. On the website, people have a chance uh, to book a call with us, 25 minutes intro section, and then they can tell us like all of the things where they have headaches regarding their customer service, customer experience and also like customer success so when they already have like a few users and they want to develop further so that they trade more we also find strategies on that one okay excellent i'll make sure i'll put all the links both on the audio and the video thank you very much thank you very much that's all for the crypto podcast you'll find out our episodes on the crypto podcast.org as mentioned we're on BitChute and youtube and my other podcasts the meditation learn polish the awakening and the speaking podcast as well as the coaching can be found at bio.link forward slash podcaster be sure to give us a thumbs up five star rating really helps until next week take care